Zach Burton and the Pork Chop Express, and I'm talking to whoever's listening out there. Today I'd like to talk about another John Carpenter film. And this one was a lot more influential than any of the others I've talked about. This was released when I was only about three, so I couldn't have watched it upon release, but I feel I was less than ten when I did see it. So it really stuck in there. There are a couple of scenes as well that disturbed me a little that hung on for a lot longer than they probably should have. But let's talk about Big Trouble in Little China from 1986. The original treatment was written by Gary Goldman and David Zed Weinstein, and then later adapted by W.D. Richter, and I'll get onto that in a moment. It stars Kurt Russell, Kim Cattrall, Dennis Dunn, James Hong, Carter Wong as Thunder, who is amazing, and I'll get onto him later, and of course Victor Wong, who's a delight in everything he's in as Egg Shen. But the adaptation credit really bugged me when I read about it when I was researching, because W.D. Richter effectively rewrote the thing from top to bottom. The original treatment was set still San Francisco, still with a Chinese mysticism, but it was the Old West. It was basically a Western. Instead of his truck, it was a horse that got stolen. And it was believed that most Americans will probably have no real live experience of the Old West because unless they're really, really old, it's just not believable. So the best way to sell a story is to have as much believable as possible before you put the fantastical elements in. So having it set in a modern time, which is where most Americans live, makes sense because most Americans, probably based on demographics and what have you, are not Chinese. So they're not gonna be as versed in Chinese mysticism. So you're selling them on the fantastical of that by grounding it in something that's familiar. It's why Buffy works quite well. It's why Angel works quite well. You're less removed from the story they're trying to tell. Lord of the Rings, of course, is a separate thing because it's a big world. It's all part of the same storytelling device. Those kind of big fantasy things work because the whole thing serves the story. The whole story is removed. It's not an element. And I love that fact. I don't think it would have worked as well as a Western, truly and honestly. And, of course, they also made Gracie a lot more of an influential character. Like I say, Richter's adaptation was an extensive rewrite, but, you know, politics of Writers Guild and all that kind of stuff, the original people who came up with it got the writer credit and they got an adaptation, which probably paid less, if I understand correctly. But we can't do anything about it now, it's in the past. But, like I say, this was so influential on me growing up. I've always had a love of, you know, Chinese mysticism, Japanese stuff... Basically, the East has always been very interesting to me, not in like a, an obsessively I want to be Japanese, but I am learning Japanese. I don't want to learn Chinese because there's so much inflection and I don't want to try and say one word and then say something completely offensive. So I'm starting on like the easier mode, I guess, of the Eastern languages. But it's something that I have had, you know, a, an interest in for a long while. And like I say, this probably set a lot of that groundwork in. But the interesting things, you know, the, about this production are so, so many. There's so many things behind the scenes that really made it what it is. The fact that John Carpenter and Kurt Russell had worked together for a few times now and become good friends. So that when what a Western audience would believe is the hero, is in the story, he's actually a sidekick. And getting someone who was a rising star to agree to basically play the bumbling sidekick in an Asian-centric, Hollywood-produced film. That's a tough sell for anyone who has a real ego, and I understand the pun in that one with Kurt Russell having an ego. But he doesn't, clearly. Or his friendship with JC was like, yeah, I'll do it. This sounds fun. The energy and the enjoyment of what's going on really, really are so apparent in this. We have the visual gags that come so fast and frequent. The, the gun exchange scene is one that I particularly love. They're just talking about it and swapping guns. It's almost like an airplane level or naked gun level or police squad level, whatever. You know, the where what's actually going on in the scene is completely different, but the thing that's really funny is just a little background moment. The, I suppose, a more overt one is when he opens the door. It's like, oh, we'll just go out here. And there's just a massive group of Chinese martial artists stood there just stock still. And then they shut the door, it's like, maybe not. Those kind of gags are absolutely brilliant, and there's so much of that in this. And like I say, this, to many Western audiences, is, oh, it's an action film with Kurt Russell as the hero. 
No, this is an action film with Dennis Dunn as Wang Chi playing the hero. And I love the fact that it subverts that expectation. Because he does have so many moments where he's just a bumbling fool. The final fight, he's rescued so often by many of these other fighters in the, in the room. You know, other characters are saving him. He takes out very few people on his own. But every sidekick gets a moment. And that's why he has the catch and return knife thing uh, to Lopan at the end. There is, you know, there is that payoff. Like, yes, the sidekick can sometimes do good. Further in that as well, the ending, when Kim Cattrall's like, hey, can I convince you to stick around? He's like, nah. And to a lot of people, it's like, oh, you're subverting it. The hero doesn't get the girl. No, he does. The hero gets the girl. Wang Chi gets Miao Yin. Because Wang Chi is the hero, not Jack Burton. And I love the fact that this subversion doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel unusual. It actually just really works for the plot. And the, the respect and everything like that in, in this by everyone on board is apparent. Like I say, everyone enjoyed this clearly, although there were a few moments that were probably less enjoyable. Both Kim Cattrall and Susie Pye don't have green eyes. They had to wear contacts, and on more modern releases like Blu-ray, high-definition things, basically, you can see the sort of edges but they both have brown eyes and they both have to wear contacts and they're absolute troopers, so that probably wasn't fun. But Susie Pye also had a quite painful experience with James Hong, unfortunately. When he's sort of jabbing her with a needle of love, there is a moment if you look, and I knew about this before I rewatched it, so I was looking out for it. And it'll probably be up while I'm talking now. But if you look, she does wince visibly because he was pushing a little harder than he probably should have done. These kind of things happen in film and it just sells the moment even more. Like, even though she's meant to be under this trance, he's going for it because he's in the moment. He's, I need to get this mortality, I need to become flesh again and rule the universe from beyond the grave, as he says his goal is. And he just goes for it. You know, I, I don't fault James Hong for really being in character in that moment. He's got that enjoyment, he's got this like desire, he just wants to get this thing done so he can get on with his master plan. And it's just a brilliant moment that, you know, even while she's under this, she's still reacting. I, I, I don't think it ruins the moment. I think it just reinforces it. There's so many moments in this, like I say, that I absolutely love. And the whole thing just works. It's an action film steeped in Chinese mysticism. And even if you don't have a previous knowledge, they explain enough to make it make sense. I don't know if Ching Tai is a real thing or if it's something made up for this film. It doesn't matter. I don't know if any of the stuff they talk about in Chinese mysticism is actually 100% real. I get a feeling, because they were trying to be as respectful as possible to the Asian side of things, that it was. Or at least very much based in it and then elaborated, if not entirely a real thing. But this was great. I really enjoyed everything about it. And I do want to end with Carter Wong because he's got such a wonderful expressive face and his character of Thunder is part of that whole disturbing thing to me. Actually, there's a couple of things I do want to tack on after this, but Carter Wong is weird. In this film, obviously, he's a bad guy. This is what I mainly know him for. And yet, I really have this weird warmth towards him. I do find him an interesting face to look at. I think it's because he's very expressive. He's almost like he's an Asian Arnold Schwarzenegger, perhaps. He's got that expressiveness, but he's, he's, he's a man mountain. He's quite well built. The disturbing moment came, obviously, when he expanded himself. Like Cohagen at the end of Total Recall. Both of those things, to me, were terrifying as I was growing up. I mean, actually, I haven't seen this film for such a long time that I was dreading that moment because I was like, oh, I'm not going to like it. And I looked at it and going, yeah, that's obviously not real. And it's actually really funny. It's done for comic effect. But, like I said, I was probably less than 10, so give me that one. The Beholder, I mean, the Floating Eye was really well done as well. You know, talking about sort of effects work. It was a really complex puppet with like a, a special map process to help it, you know, sort of blend in with the scene. But it worked really well. It, it was so complex, but that helped it sell itself as a real thing. This kind of spy for Lopan floating around. The credits of this film are also great because the band playing the music at the end is the Coupe de Villes, 
which is a band formed of John Carpenter, obviously the director of this, Nick Castle, who wrote, amongst other things, Escape from New York, and Tommy Lee Wallace, who was the second unit director on this. So that Big Trouble in Little China song at the end is, yeah, it, that's, who it, that's who's doing that song. And also, talking about the end, we obviously see the uh, sequel bait moment with the demon thing. And apparently in further materials released afterwards, like graphic novels and such, he's referred to mostly as a demon or hell beast, and apparently he's called Pete by Jack Burton. So there you go. If you didn't know that before, I hope uh, that's enlightened you on what actually happened with, with that little creature reaching up at the end. But the last thing I want to say is something that I've suspected for a long time. I'm a big fan of the Mortal Kombat series, more for the lore than gameplay. I may actually talk about the films at some point down the line, and yes, I mean the films. I'm willing to do that. <laughs> Sorry. I always felt that Raiden felt very much like the Three Storms. Not the hat, because the hat's a lot more kind of you know, curved, if you will. But it's the typical Rice Farmer hat that Raiden wears. But I did feel that inspiration. And apparently, yes, I'm right. Part of the inspiration for Raiden was the three storms in this film. Also, Shang Tsung, of course, took inspiration from Lo Pan, because of course it would. We have a sorcerer who has a younger version and an old decrepit man version. It does make a lot of sense. So, yeah, I was actually on the money, and I'm quite pleased with that. But this was great. I really enjoy Big Trouble in Little China. It was a joy to watch again. It's been so long between, and I may watch it again, you know, in a few years, because it's such a fun romp. At some point, by the way, uh, Suki4040, I will get to John Carpenter's Vampires at some point. I promise you that. Maybe I'll leave it to Halloween. Maybe I'll do it before. I don't know. But keep an eye out. And everyone else, stay tuned for what's coming next, because I've got so many weird stuff coming down the line that I want to talk about and review and analyse. So that's all from me today, but until next time, as always, thank you for watching and take care.